we're studying the law. This is class number 180 on our Bible readings, and this we started this this last year. We've been doing it about a year, and it has been very rewarding for me. I hope it has been rewarding for you. I have loved doing this. I'm looking forward to going into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and reading them. I think we ought to read all of them, uh, all the Gospels. We've done probably 75% of the Bible so far in these 180 classes. And, and it's been rewarding to me and exciting to me. And I hope it has been that way to you all over the world. I hope it's not too elementary. I tried to do some pretty deep things tonight. I'm going to uh, quote from a book called Commentary on the Old Testament. This is a, the Pentateuch, or the first five books of Moses, and this is Kyle and DeLeash. Now, Kyle and DeLeash is written in uh, <laughs> several languages. It's basically English, but it'll take off on a tangent in Latin or in German. It'll take off in Greek and Hebrew, of course, absolutely. It'll compare the Septuagint with the Hebrew Bible, and uh, that's what we're going to look about, is about some things in here, uh, chapter 19 and 20, and I didn't bring this up in chapter 19, so I'm going to bring it up here, and it, uh, <clears throat> it is interesting. Now, I know that most of you don't have Kyle and Delish. Maybe you can look it up online. I don't know. But you've got to know some Hebrew, and you've got to know Greek, and some little Latin, and some German. And uh, anyway, and you've got to be, be able to read Roman numerals also, which are not really Roman numerals. They're Greek characters. That's what they are. The Greeks borrowed, they, or the Romans borrowed the Greek characters, and it's called Roman numerals. But an X is a key. Uh, the I is the iota, etc., etc., the nu. Uh, move, whatever, uh, sigma, and it's all capital letters from, from the Greek. Now let me go here and, and, and just read uh, some of the things it says. <clears throat> the mountain of God. Now, here in Fish Lake Valley, God owns all of this. He even owns here where, where I live here on, on, on the creek. This is his. It'll always be his. We have a title to it and all this, but that is hogwash. <laughs> First of all, the government can take it away from me anyway. And uh, that's exactly what they're trying to do uh, uh, so much in America today, uh, going toward communism uh, through China, etc., but they don't want your children to, uh, to uh, inherit your wealth if you have any. It goes back to the state. They, they're trying to even tax the... the uh, and this is, you know, what we have is rampant re inflation in America. Well, when your property is worth more, now they want to tax it. You didn't sell it, but they want to tax the capital gains on it. And this is terrible. This is corruption, anyway. That's what it is. Well, let's get back here to this now. God owns everything. He even owns Washington, D.C., even though they think they got the, the world by the tail there. In the 19th chapter of the book of Exodus, it makes some statements. In uh, page 95, I'm going to start here and read some things, quote some things. It tells here where Mount Sinai was. It says in the, in the plain of Saboya, uh, in the camp in the desert of Sinai. And The cattle could not possibly have grazed upon it, but only in the plain of Shaboye, and therefore proves that the camp is in the desert of Sinai. It is not to be sought for in the plain of Rahab, but in the plain of Saboye, 
which reaches to the foot of Sinai. There had to be grass for the cattle. Abraham followed grass, and now we will have Israel following grass also. And it tells you here where it is. And on page 96, it talks about Israel being the treasure of God. Israel was a treasure of God and a holy people for himself. Now, looking ahead today, we are a treasure of God as members of New Testament churches. We are precious in God's sight. We are a treasure of God. It says here, the promises precede the demand. For the grace of God always anticipates the wants of mankind and does not demand before it is given. Jehovah spoke to Moses from Mount Horeb. Moses had probably ascended one of the lower heights, while Jehovah is to be regarded as on the summit of the mountain. The words of God referred, first of all, to what he had done for the Egyptians, or done for and to the Egyptians, and how he had uh, borne Israel, the Israelites, on eagles' wings, manifesting in his way not only the separation of Israel and the Egyptians. God wants to separate us from the world, by the way. God's people are supposed to be a shining light in the world. We're not supposed to be like the rest of the world. A Christian cannot be a crooked businessman. You can make money, but you can't be a crooked businessman. If you're a crooked businessman, then you're not a Christian. If you're looking where you can cheat people right and left in every way, you're not a Christian. As simple as that. We had two Christian men, leaders of America, uh, over a hundred years ago. One of them was uh, John Rockefeller. And John Rockefeller was a Baptist. He had a competitor uh, that was a Presbyterian. And the Presbyterian went to his pastor and he felt so sorry for what he had done. He was over the steel industry and everything and he had killed and maimed thousands of Americans to make his money. He hired this horrible man. Named, he was Carnegie, who it was, Carnegie. He had hired this absolute outlaw to run his business while he went over to uh, Europe and Scotland and played golf and things over there. And he took care of his dirty work here and they, he, he killed thousands of workers and maimed them. Finally, one of the workers tried to kill him and the rat lived through it. But anyway, both of them, uh, first of all, the Presbyterian had more conscience than the Baptist did. Carnegie went to his pastor and said, what can I do? How can I repay what I have done to the American people? Well, he said, uh, build libraries so they can learn. And they have access to learning. Build libraries. So he had the Carnegie libraries. He established colleges, he established college funds, etc., etc., etc. Well, these big titans of America, uh, John Rockefeller, decided that he's going to outdo Carnegie because he's got more money anyway. And so he puts up uh, the trust, you know, this was Standard Oil and, and uh, all the things, and he had done the same thing. He had maimed people, he had... He had destroyed the economy. They basically bought the election in 1890 and, and 90, uh, or 1892 uh, and 96, I believe it was, or 96 and 1900. Anyway, they threatened their workers if they voted a Democrat that they would close their businesses and they would be out of jobs. You vote here, and they voted at work. 
Democrats here, Republicans over here. They threatened them and they wanted that all the money they could pour into the campaign. Except when we get to Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt uh, threw a, a sabot in there. He sabotaged their mess because he turned the Republican Party around. Well, John D. Rockefeller and Carnegie really did a lot of things in colleges and all of that. Carnegie asked his pastor, what can I do? Build schools and colleges and trusts and funds for people so their children can get out of the... The children were working in the factories too. Children were working in the factories. Little children were being maimed, blinded, maimed for the rest of their life and become beggars. Because we didn't have social security or anything like that back then. Mm -hmm. They had nothing to protect the workers. Well, anyway, uh, the, the, Israel had been down in Egypt for a long time. And the Egyptian state of mind had, been, had influenced them greatly. When they left Egypt, it was hard to get Egypt out of Israel. Mm -hmm. As simple as that. God wanted them to be separate from those people. God wants us to be separate in this world today. The words of God refer first of all to what he had done for the done for and to the Egyptians and how he had borne Israel on, on eagles' wings and manifesting uh, way not only the separation between Israel and the Egyptians but also the adoption of Israel as a nation of his special grace. God's Son died for all mankind, universal atonement. But, strong adversity of conjunction, <laughs> page 15, <laughs> Allah in Greek, okay? Strong adversity of conjunction, but it is efficacious only to those that believe and, and respond to the call of God graciously. God always extends grace before he sends judgment. And he did that even down in Egypt. A doctrine of Israel as a nation of his special grace and favor. The eagle's wings are figurative and denote the strong and loving care of God. The eagle watches over his young in the midst of, in a careful manner, in a most careful manner, flying under and over them, when he leads them from the nests, lest they should fall upon the rocks and be injured or destroyed. Deuteronomy 32 and 11. And the proofs uh, from profane literature, uh, Vokart, Hebrews uh, 2, page 762, 765. And brought you unto myself. Sharon, when God calls you to himself, when he called you to grace, when he called you to salvation, he was touching your very soul. Marilyn, when God called you to himself, he was touching your soul with his mercy and his grace. And all of you out there, everywhere in the world, Donald Grewar over there and, and Wales, wherever, when God calls you unto himself, he's touching your very soul with his soul. intimate relationship God is entering with you and he said he led you to the dwelling place of God Mount Sinai and God wanted to impose upon them the respect that he that he demands that mountain's holy Wherever God is, is holy. This little church here in Fish Lake Valley tonight is a holy place unto God. He said, I took you unto my protection and my especial care. The manifestation of the love of God to Israel formed only the pre-manifestations of the love of God to Israel and to, uh, as a prelude, however, to the gracious union which Jehovah was about now to establish between Israelites and himself. Israel would become a nation, but there's a special nation there 
but there are special responsibilities to Israel. It is a conditional covenant. It is a conditional covenant. The Abrahamic, the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant are not conditional. They are unconditional covenants, but the, the covenant with Israel is a conditional covenant. But because of the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant, God's going to bring them back even though they're outlaws today in this church age that we see up here. God will bring them back to himself in the tribulation period. He's going, they're going to be so beat up they're going to start screaming and hollering for their protector. Daddy, daddy, help me. Abba, Abba, help me. Because they're going to be destroyed. Two-thirds of the Jews in the world are going to be destroyed during the tribulation period. But God's going to save that one-third of the Jewish nation to take it into it with himself and to fulfill that covenant, the Davidic covenant in the millennial reign for 1,000 years. Many scholars believe that the resurrected David would be on the throne in Jerusalem and Jesus, his son, will be on the throne in heaven with his bride. <clears throat> if they will only hear his voice, if they will only hear his voice and keep the covenant which is about to be established with them, they should be a costly possession to him out of all nations. And God, all of the saved people, Israel, all of them back that were taken out in Egypt, were under the blood of Jesus Christ to come. Jesus stood as a lamb before the foundation of the world, before anything happened. Jesus was stood as a lame, lamb slain before the foundation of anything. Every person that would ever be saved, ever be resurrected, in the resurrection was saved under the blood of Jesus Christ. Salvation was completed on the cross of Calvary and finished there at the resurrection. But it's instituted here. Out of all the nations, Megalah does not signify property in general, but also a valuable property. Megalah is a valuable property. It's in Hebrew here, by the way. It is a precious property. You know the most precious property that a man has in this world are his children. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. It's his children. The most precious, the most precious things that God owns is you and me because he bought us with his blood and we are adopted at wheel thesia we're placed as sons placed as sons by the blood of his, his son Jesus Christ and God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son God loved the world he loved, he loved mankind more than he did himself because he suffered for us this is all trying to, it's all pointing to it. By the way, the law was laid down there, and the law killed us all. We all should die under the law. But thank goodness we're not under the law according to Paul in the book of Galatians and Ephesians. The law was nailed to the cross also. It says here, property in general, but valuable property, which is laid aside or put aside. I wish I had an extra magnifying glass right now. Migal. Hence a treasure, silver and gold, 1 Chronicle 24 and 3, and Ecclesiastes 2 and 8. And in the Septuagint, the expression is rendered as laos, parousias. Laos parousios, which the scholars scal in Aza interprets as exaretos, and in Malachi 3.17, ace peripoesin. Hence the two phrases in the New Testament, as you can see, we're going into Greek now, in the Greek Septuagint. We've left the English language. A people precious. A people, a laos precious. Laos precious, parousios. And in uh, Titus 2 and 14, the word laos 
Ace Peri Poason, and in 1 Peter 2 9, Jehovah had chosen Israel as his costly possession out of all the nations of the earth, and it cost God his son to redeem Israel. We've all been saved by grace. That's it. There's only one way of salvation. Even then, as they looked at the law, but they believed. Because the whole earth was his possession, the entire earth. And all nations belong to him as creator and preserver. Now, Satan is still messing around. It's over, it's, Satan's in Washington, D.C. right now, man. I mean, he's work, doing a good job up there. And all nations belong to him as creator and preserver, and the reason thus assigned for the selection of Israel precludes at the very onset the exclusiveness which would regard Jehovah as merely a national deity. Israel would look at God as a national asset, not as redeemer and not as master, but a national asset. But this is a conditional covenant. The part of it that is a Davidic covenant is unconditional. God will bring them back. But these people here were under conditions. That's why Israel was carried off in captivity. Conditional covenant. The idea of the Sikala is explained in verse 6. Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests. Malaka signifies kingship. Malak is the root of that. As the embodiment of a royal supremacy, exaltation, dignity, and the kingdom are the union of both king and subject. The land and the nation together with its king. In the passage before us, the word has been understood by most early commentators, both Jewish and Christian, and also in the ancient versions, in the first or active sense, so that the expression contains the idea, ye shall be all priests and kings. Ye shall be all priests and kings. God is the great king, and we are manifest his glory on this earth by how we are by what we are here we go into latin now prodiditos sore tam sacrale tote quiam regio on the re good regis o quiad regis et sacrados well, I wish I had more magnification. Sant e replica, republica, wheels, eritus, mihi. This explanation is required by both the passage itself and the context, for apart from the fact that the kingship is the primary and most general meaning of the word, mamelika, And the kingship and the government here for a kingdom of priests could never denote the fellowship ex existing in a kingdom between the king and the priest. A king was always that high and the people were always laying on their faces to God. But God kisses you into his kingdom. God, by a kiss of love, brings you into his kingdom. For we look to him, we will see Jesus as he is, face to face, our Savior. We come to God, the King of the universe, through his Son, and our Savior, and our brother, in human form. But only in a kingdom of a commonwealth, consisting of priests, a kingdom, the members and citizens of which were priests, and as priests constituted the Malachah, in other words, were a possession of royal dignity, of a royal family. You know, until America came along, there were, I don't think there, ever, there was never another American experiment in history. 
and there probably will never be another. In America, they wrote a constitution to protect the people from the government. <laughs> it put chains. The constitution puts chains on the governors. It puts chains for they make them, they have rules. We must hold them to the rules that the Constitution, we must not sweep away the Constitution, but we must hold them to the Constitution. When criminal families like the Bush and the Biden families get into the White House, that's bad situation, people. It costs thousands of people's lives. Thousands of people die because of these outlaws. You know, in the old, I, I watch a lot of old Western movies. I like Roy Rogers and, and uh, Hopalong Cassidy and Gene Autry and all of those. And you know the whole story about all the Westerns is, is that big bad guys and some hero comes along and he rescues the local heroines and heroes by killing the bad guys. Isn't that what it's all about? Isn't that what it's still all about? The big shot, the powerful, rich, overtaking and strangling the poor worker. The poor cattleman out there on his little ranch trying to grind the eke out a living and give it to his children when he died. They come in there and they kill him and they kill his children. And that's what all of these old stories are about what it's all about. One message, good and bad, and we hope that the good overcomes the bad. They were possessed of royal dignity and power. Mama, Mamalika, Basilia, always includes the idea of Malek, the king, Malek, the king, or the ruling one, Basileon, Basileon. In the Septuagint, have quite a hit, a hit, a hit the meaning of their ending. Basilea Erutium, uh, Israel, was to be a royal body of priests to Jehovah. They were supposed to be related to Jehovah. They were related, they're priests by relationship. Who were the priests? The priests were of the Levites, weren't they? And Simeon and, and Levi went into Shechem and killed all of the people there and robbed them after they had become converts. Wicked people. You know that the Levites didn't have an inheritance? Jacob on his deathbed cursed them. You are implements of Hamas, violence. Hamas means violence. That's the Hebrew word Hamas. Implements of violence. My soul does not delight in you. But God took those broken crack pot vessels and used them as priests among his people. He can use them, he can sure use us, can he? No matter how bad a man is in this world, God can save his soul and use him. Israel will be a royal body of priests to Jehovah and not merely a union of priests governed by Jehovah. The idea of the theocracy, our government of God, as founded by the establishment of the Sinaitic Covenant institution in Israel, is not at all involved in the term kingdom of priests. In the world today, we are a kingdom of priests in the world. It talks about the church being a kingdom of priests and Israel becoming a kingdom of priests in the millennial reign. But you know, the millennial reign is only 1,000 years, and after that, all things change again. The theocracy was established by the conclusion of the covenant in chapter 24, and was the only means adopted by Jehovah for making his chosen people a royal body of priests, a royal body of priests, a royal body, because God bought them with his blood. In the future tense. 
You know it says that in, 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 I, in, in Isaac, when Abraham tithed them to God, we are recipients of that tithe that Abraham did. When you tithe to God, your children will be blessed. That's what it teaches. When you tithe to God, your children will be blessed. The maintenance of the covenant was the indispensable subjection of condition upon which their attainment of this divinely appointed destiny and glory depended. The promises of Jehovah expressed the design of the call of Israel. God called Israel out of Egypt and God calls us out of the world with holy communion between his soul and ours. to which it was fully conducted by the covenant institution of the theocracy, if it maintained the covenant with Jehovah, the object of Israel's kingship and priesthood was to be found in the nations of the earth, out of which Jehovah had chosen Israel as a costly possession. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that promise was all the way back to Genesis 3.15. Anyone that's ever been saved in the history of the world or the nation or anybody out there in, in a, a heathens are saved under the covenant of that blood. Basileia Haray Teus A royal priesthood a priestly nation of royal power and glory, of royal power and glory. When Israel was worshiping, the world knew it. Jehovah was there in his Shekinah glory, in his presence. When I preach, I know that the words go out throughout the world, and I know the Shekinah glory of God goes with it. People are convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. I've had people call me from... It's far away places seeking salvation. <laughs> Calling me on the telephone. What a deal. Jehovah, Shekinah glory, working through his word wherever it goes. Israel's kingship and priesthood was to be found in the nations of the earth out of which Jehovah had chosen Israel as a costly possession, this great and glorious promise and the fulfillment of which could not be attained until the completion Kings and priests Malachon Kohenach The kings and priests, Eucolos, Erates, Coroma, Me, Regis, Coronati. It goes through different languages. It'll go into Greek, it'll go into Latin, and it'll come back in Hebrew. And sometimes even say something in English here. Sacred judges is what they are, sacred judges. The priests are sacred judges. One of the messages that I taught, righteous judges. Wouldn't it be wonderful that the president and the vice president and all the senate and all the house of representatives were all righteous? Righteousness only by the blood of Jesus Christ. If they know God and they judge according to the rules of God, if they judge according to the Constitution, Constitutio, it says here in the Latin. The kingdom of God, when the Israel of God and the church of the Lord, which Jesus Christ, the first begotten from the dead, the price, the prince, that is, the archon ruler, the number one, the head ruler, the prince, saves our souls. The ruler of the kings of the earth has made a kingdom of priests unto God and his father. Revelation 1 and 6. And in verse 10, where the reading should be Basilea Kahires, 
kings and priests, or kings even priests, kings even priests. Chi, page 208 in an analytical Greek lexicon, Chi there means it, it can be a conjunction, it can be a strong adversative conjunction, and it also can mean a cumulative article, which means also even yes. Kings, even priests, yes priest. Kings, amen priest. Is exalted to glory with Christ as the firstborn among many brethren and sits upon his throne and reigns. Has not been introduced to introduce abruptly here, but in all of the sacrificial elements of the law, Jesus Christ was in introduced to Israel. Every lamb, every turtle dove, every sheep, every bull, every heifer that was offered and killed was a type of what Jesus did for us on Calvary. Yeah. This is powerful stuff. I'm loving this. <laughs> I hope you are, even though all the Latin and the Greek and the Hebrew may not mean a whole lot to you, but it goes to, I'm leaving a little bit of it out because they're quoting lots of writers in Latin. You know that <clears throat> after the Catholic Church took over uh, the reigns of uh, the world, basically, uh, judicially, the church and the state became one. The Greek Bible was the, the, the language was a common language, Koine Greek. But the, the Catholic Church changed the language of the Bible into Latin. And all legal languages were in Latin. And every doctorate, every bachelor's degree, every master's degree was written in Latin in those eight years. From about four or five hundred to as long as the Catholic Church had power. Your legal language in America is Latin. Your scientific language is Greek. Your legal language is Latin. <clears throat> it is as also the glory with Christ as the firstborn among many brethren, and sets upon his throne and reigns. It's not introduced here abruptly, but it will be in all the sacrifices under the law. God tells them everything they're doing, everything they're thinking, everything they're saying is blasphemy and illegal. And he said, you keep on doing it. It's in the imperfect tense. You keep on killing, you keep on lusting after, you keep on stealing, you keep on lying, you keep on committing perjury. And all these things that they were doing, they were continuing to do. Look what they did in Jesus' trial was nothing but perjury and lies and absolutely violence to the justice of God. On the contrary, the way was already prepared by the promises to the patriarchs of the blessing which Abraham would become to all nations as it through his seed, and of the kings who were to spring from him come out of the loins of Israel. Genesis 12 and 3 and 17 and 6 and 35 and verse 11, and still more distinctly by Jacob's prophecy of the scepter of Judah to whom through Shiloh, the willingness and submission of the king of the nation should be made in Genesis, going back to the promise of 315. But these promises and prophecies are outshone by the clearness with which kingship and priesthood over for the nations are foretold of Israel here. <coughs> That's just an introduction to the law. Isn't that quite an introduction? I had to bring this to you, and I'm not finished. We'll go on from here. Now, when I taught the book of Exodus from Hebrew, I went into some of this, but I'm going to go into it deeper now than what I ever did before. I'm going to do it better. I want to make it clearer to you. We'll still, we're still studying Hebrew, 
and we're studying a little bit of Latin, we're studying Greek and all of this all together as we look at this. We're studying history, we're studying uh, animal husbandry, we're studying the promises of God and the clear introduction of Jesus Christ to Israel through the sacrifices. Our Father, we thank you for your word, your glorious, glorious, glorious word. We thank you for our Savior. Father, please use this message for your honor and glory. Touch hearts throughout the world with it. Show them how much you love them. All we have to do is submit and believe. And you give us the faith to even believe. Please forgive me where I failed you. In Jesus' name.